o'clock. Can we have the people take their seats, please? Thank you. You will respect my authority. <laughs> Um, I want to welcome you to the um, first Infrastructure Services Committee meeting of the Triennium on February 10th. Um, this is actually, I think, our first committee meeting of the Triennium. Um, so I welcome the new councillors to, to, the, to the room and returning councillors coming back. Um, we don't have a public forum today, so I'll go straight on to apologies. I will move that we accept the apologies from um, Mia Hawkins, Councillor Fiso, and Councillor Wiley. I have a second, uh, Councillor Walker. All those in favour? Against? Great. Confirmation of the agenda. I move that we confirm the agenda without alteration or addition. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Radich, all those in favour? Aye. Against? Moving right along. Declarations of interest. Has anybody's interest register changed since it's been published? Councillor Lord. Uh, yeah, look, I'd just like to have taken off that I'm no longer a shareholder in Silver Fern Farms. And, um, I'm also now the chair of the Rural Support Trust and the chair of the Federated Farmers Trusts. Great. Ms. Lapham, you've captured this. <coughs> you will. Okay. I move then that we amend the elected members interest register as attached in attachment A and amend the proposed management plan for elected members interest. Second to Council Staines. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Passed. Um, on to Part A reports. Is Mr Dyer here? Maybe we should have adjusted the... <laughs> okay. Um, we'd have to change the agenda. <laughs> Why don't you go down there and start? Welcome, Mr. Drew. Um, I just remind everybody too that these are activity reports um, for the last six months ending December. And so if you can make sure that your questions and your comments relate to what's on the report. <coughs> Thanks. Any questions? Councillor Gary. I'm hoping you'll indulge me, uh, Chair. Um, Mr. Drew, can you just um, talk about, I notice there's a, a section 16 which talks about the number of wet weather waste water overflows um, and obviously that's impacted by, um, to some degree, by our knowledge. My question's around the rain radar and whether we know, because we don't have really accurate information, uh, whether we know where that's, that progress is up to, do we have any knowledge of that at all? Uh, I don't have an update on that. Uh, I asked uh, Mr Dyer, who hopefully will turn up shortly to get an update on that. Uh, when we talked about it last week, uh, we knew that there was a site that had been selected, but we don't know how far they were in procuring and um, installation. Well, their preferred site, I think, was what we knew. Uh, but uh, that rain, da rain radar would be really beneficial for events like uh, last week, where... Um, it was fortuitous that I was driving home and saw some of the uh, surface flooding and surcharging. Um, and, and we were watching the predicted weather patterns and, and thought the peak was coming later, but it actually turned up earlier than we thought, so we weren't uh, as prepared as we could have been if we'd seen that peak coming earlier. So am I right that it would affect how you manage the event? Yeah, it would give us more up-to-date uh, real-time information of, of where the intensity is. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Lord. <coughs> yeah, I just had a problem, so, uh, not a problem, a question, Simon, and it was um, page 23, uh, bullet point 32. It says the Carlisle Road uh, pump upgrades, and it says this project is to renew existing pumps at Carlisle Road, and I just wanted to ask the question probably of Tom, but... This is, I, I just want to clarify, this is not just a renewing of the current level of service. Uh, firstly, apologies for lateness. Um, the the Carlisle Road pumps upgrade is a minor upgrade, so we're renewing the existing pumps uh, that, are, that are there already. We're not reconfiguring any pipe work. Um, those pumps will provide a little bit of extra capacity, but not 
Not, uh, not a significant level. There is another project. Um, Reed Avenue. At Reed Avenue yeah. and Carlisle Road. Um, that will look at more significant upgrades in the near term. Sorry, so you will put a, your intention is to put another pumping station in at Carlisle Road as well as the current one being upgraded a bit? Yep, so the, so the current one is just a renewal of the existing pumps. They're, um, they're very old and um, at a reasonably high risk of failure. Um, we thought it was prudent not to wait uh, until that other upgrade but to put, put these new ones in. Um, uh, gives us some breathing space to get the other upgrade work done properly. Yep. And the and the Reed Avenue, um, if if I may through the chair, the Reed Avenue final um, job, <coughs> how much greater capacity will be there than the current Reed Avenue one? Uh, so the current plan is for three times more capacity um, at Reed Ave. Um, however, um, as you'll see in the report, there's um, we have had some cost escalations there, and we're starting to look at the viability of delivering that work versus something that might be slightly less than three times and three times increase but potentially better bang for buck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, yep, th th thanks for the, re uh, the great report. Um, certainly intriguing uh, late night reading for a first time councillor. Um, point 25, um, could you just give me a little bit of um, um, history around why the Warrington plant cannot meet the nitrogen limit scenario? Um, so Warrington was consented on the basis of the existing plant, um, so without any upgrades and, and that sort of thing, um, quite some time, time ago, so early 2000s, I believe. Um, the, the consent uh, was for, w w uh, the consent method or development method um, uh, included some scientific work around um, nitrogen limits um, and we believe there was an error in that work. The nitrogen limits at that site are much lower um, than at our other sites uh, and we've continued to um, have non-compliances there. Um, we've looked at upgrade options and looked at a whole bunch of other um, ways of dealing with it. We've looked at it, um, environmental impacts, so done some environmental impact studies, um, all of which have pointed to it not necessarily being a significant issue. Um, uh, and with agreement from the IRC have, um, uh, have said that we'll address it in the next round of consenting and, and upgrades, uh, which is a forecast for 2026. Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Tom, for your report. It's really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've just got three questions. Um, the first one relating to point five about um, the four services areas for water. And given that um, we had the fire, um, what um, measures are being ta taken to protect those areas? Um, so <coughs> since um, since the deep stream fire we've done a little bit of work we've, we've learnt a lot about our systems in terms of how they operate and what levels of capacity we, we have a lot of those numbers have been um, calculated or theoretical in the past and now we can we can um, when we run a pipeline hard we can kind of show exactly what kind of flow we can get and demonstrate resilience there um, with relation to um, the suppliers that were affected from that event, we've learnt a lot. Um, however, we, we haven't yet started looking at um, risks of other catchment fires or other events that might impact um, uh, other sources. Okay, um, second question was um, just about the number of foul sewer blockages, which is tracking lower, which is great. What does proactive cleaning mean? So what do you do here? Uh, so two, two or three annual plans ago, um, uh, two annual plans ago, uh, the council chose to fund um, an additional uh, uh, a sucker truck, um, a large truck that can flush and, and remove blockages from the network and, and clean um, certain bits of pipe. Um, we've, so we've upped our maintenance program um, reasonably significantly. We've also, um, uh, we have also done quite a bit of work over the last decade on renewals um, uh, in terms of um, trying to 
target our most um, damaged or, or affected pipes and therefore the pipes most prone to blockage and that's helped to reduce um, reduce that trend over time. The, what we're seeing now is that a greater proportion of the blockages we're seeing in our network are caused by um, by fat and wet wipes um, than has been in the, has been in the past. Um, and so now we're starting to look at other methods of managing that. So have you considered um, advertising and things like that? Yes, yeah, so we've started looking at some of the successful campaigns of um, uh, from around New Zealand and further abroad. Um, one one that stands out as a as a success story is um, the recent campaign from Tauranga City Council that's um, um, uh, been quite well um, quite well delivered and then, and also shown quite significant um, uh, results in terms of statistics within their network. So um, we'll, we'll be considering that over the near term. Cool. Um, and just with the Reed Avenue and Carlisle Road stormwater pump station, um, it's costing a bit more. Has this been budgeted for? In no. Need? No, it hasn't. Um, but what, what we're going to the work we're going to undertake in the near term is to just go back to the options business case and make sure that um, uh, that what we do what we do end up putting forward is, is in, in the next steps is um, as an option that's cost effective. At at that kind of number, it starts to become um, it, it starts to look like there's potentially other options for us to build a slightly different style of pump station that, that might deliver not quite the same flow benefits, but at a more efficient cost. Oh, th and thanks for the report too, it's great. Council Hall. Just a couple of questions. On Deep Stream, um, how are you looking at mitigating in the future the chance of any fires? Because uh, when Council bought that land, they were told this was going to happen and it's just been a matter of sitting, waiting and waiting and it's been brought up on several occasions with Council and nothing had been done. Um, so what we've looked at so far is the impact of that fire and um, the, we had about four and a half weeks uh, without water coming from that particular source um, but that was and that was much quicker than we'd anticipated um, we, we were thinking we might have the water supply out for three months um, uh, in terms of impact on the um, on the city's water supply it was much less. Uh, than we'd first anticipated, and that means that we potentially have options now to look at um, uh, fire breaks in certain areas um, and, and potentially looking at firefighting methodologies. Um, if we do that, we might be in a position where under certain seasonal conditions it, it is okay to let that fuel source burn off and, um, and start again. Um, uh, but that's still under consideration and um, I think all of those options will be on the table um, as we work through the work through the review. And um, North East Valley, with the uh, infiltration of stormwater and stuff, how far up the valley is going? Uh, I can't recall that off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, we are well, no. largely done. I think we've got one more stage to go. Yeah. Um, and so I don't believe we're going any further than and than has been um, and has been done at this stage. I think yeah. the, the last stage is down the bottom end. Are you going to have to upsize the mains down the the valley itself? Uh, there is a chance that we'll need to do that. Um, what we're what we're going to do over the next 18 months is. Um, is reevaluate how much uh, infiltration we've removed from the network, and um, and then start looking at sizing again. Because if we have, and you know, so I suspect we have been reasonably successful. Um, if we have been reasonably reasonably successful, we might be able to reduce a pipe size um, uh, when looking at that main down the middle of the valley. Yeah, about five years ago, they told me that the pipe is large enough to take anything from the from the north end. It was just that infiltration. Though I did see um, outside between Blacks Road and Selwyn Street, all the manholes were blown the other day in that rain. Yeah, that's a reasonably common occurrence during heavy rain, um, uh, and the so the areas that have been um, have been looked at, we don't yet know exactly how much of a percentage we've removed. If that percentage is significant, then we may not need to do anything. Um, uh, but if it's if it's not, then we'll need to go back to the drawing board. Councillor Radich. 
Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I really like your report. Thank you, Mr Dyer, um, especially the graphs so that we can see trends and what's happening over time. And I'm particularly impressed with the number of water main breaks and foul sewer blockages, which are decreasing steadily year on year, uh, no doubt due to your ongoing, <coughs> your increasing importance that you're placing on um, maintenance, repairs and renewals. I was wondering about the uh, unplanned water main shutdowns though, because they're taking longer to get repaired. Is that the same contractor that's doing the maintenance or a different one? And is that because you, the shift in emphasis to, you know, to a longer term view of getting uh, renewals and replacements done and less crews available for emergencies? Um, so it is the same contractor. Um, it's City Care Limited, they've got our long term uh, maintenance contract. Uh, they, in terms of, uh, we've been watching those trends as well and watching the water main failure rate go down and, and watching our, um, our rate of, um, or our number of minutes taken to, uh, to repair or to get water back on, back in service, um, uh, bounce around quite a lot and become quite a lot more variable than it has been in the past. Um, there's potentially a number of reasons for it. One, one is uh, that the, because the volume uh, has reduced, therefore the statistical significance of one long uh, uh, shutdown um, as a bigger weight on uh, or shows up in the graph more. Mm. The other is that um, potentially we're, we've targeted a whole lot of um, uh, water mains that uh, have a high failure rate, therefore reducing the, so we've renewed those pipes, therefore reducing the rate, um, but haven't targeted the ones with the longer shutdown frequency. Um, and that's certainly something that we'll be looking at for our um, next couple of years renewal program. Yes, oh, the program's working, so that's good. Thank you. Councillor Vandervis. Just to clarify detail on the infiltration issue that, that uh, was brought up by um, Councillor Hall, um, I understand a lot of the uh, foul sewer pipes are clay pipes with uh, jointing issues. Are you actually digging these up and replacing them with plastic pipe or are you actually uh, putting new liners down through the inside of the clay pipes? Uh, we haven't been lining any clay pipes as a rule. Um, uh, largely we've been doing full dig and lay replacement um, or um, a method called pipe cracking which is um, uh, get a large uh, unit that thrusts uh, plastic pipes through the middle of um, the existing clay pipe and breaks it apart, um, right. which is a little bit more robust than uh, than lining, um, but yeah. still not the, the same kind of full pipe system replacement that dig and, dig and lay methodology is. Um, but both of those methods are being used um, predominantly dig and lay. And do you have a rough idea of the percentage of uh, pipes that have infiltration problems in the network, I mean, is it <clears throat> more than half of the um, pipes leading to the main sewer mains that, that have this issue, or is it a much smaller percentage? Uh, I, I don't have that number off the top of off the top of my head at the moment. What I would say is that um, uh, most pipes of that vintage have, uh, if there's a water source around them, have a have a leakage or, or an infiltration issue, um, uh, just to varying degrees. Um, what we've tried to do. Uh, to date is uh, single out the suburbs and streets with the worst issues and then and target those pipes um, uh, looking at it on a um, on an impact and effects basis rather than um, uh, individual pipes but it's um yeah it's a, an ongoing learning exercise and as I described before we'll we'll be monitoring uh, monitoring the success of that program over the next 18 months and um, uh, depending on the results of that we'll, we'll adjust our approach. And the problem of illegal connections, which used to be a large problem, do you not think that is uh, so much of a problem anymore? And what are you doing to check to see whether or not we still have a lot of illegal connections? Uh, so the last modelling exercise we did um, certainly highlighted that our greatest um, bang for buck in terms of investment would be to target infiltration rather than inflow. Um, uh, but we'll ask that question again through the, over the next 18 months and um, uh, through our next modelling exercise. And if uh, if it, if we're starting to see a um, 
quicker response time in the network, then that would indicate, in certain areas of the network, then that would indicate um, that a targeted um, uh, sewer separation program would be worthwhile. And if that's the case, we'll do it. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Gary. Um, this was a really comprehensive report, but I did notice there wasn't anything in it about progress on the um, public-private uh, stormwater issues, and I just wonder if there's a reason for that and, and whether or not you're able to give us a verbal update. Um, so to date we have um, completed one, um, uh, one new pipeline in um, Beaconsfield Road on the peninsula. Um, uh, that, that work is, uh, I, I think, all complete now. Um, so it was the site, um, uh, it was a site where the um, sinkhole developed in the man's backyard. Um, so that's, that's finished. Um, we have uh, purchased a property in Will Street. Um, we have um, we've initiated design on four other sites um, uh, and have put some temporary works in in Bath Street. So those are all the um, kind of the uh, there's a whole bunch of other sort of short term initiatives, floodgates, sandbags, and that sort of thing for um, for other property owners. Um, but um, so those are the kind of the major short term highlights. Um, the longer term work is we're still looking at how we're going to go about that, what that policy change might look like and how it fits with um, the government's water reform program and all of that sort of stuff at the moment, but um, it's still in that early development stage. So that first tranche of work is where you would expect it to be? Uh, yeah, it is actually. I'm probably pleasantly surprised so far. Excellent, thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I ask Mr Dwyer, um, just around the North Dunedin, is it correct that at the moment the capacity for beds that we have in that area is related to our infrastructure? I suppose that's all over the city really, isn't it? But that we have a limited number in that area and it's constrained because of um, perhaps, the, the, well because of the, directly because of the capacity in our pipes. Is that the case? Uh, yep, that's largely to do with our wastewater sewers and that's one of the major one of the major drivers behind the, um, the I and I work that's going on in North East Valley. Um, yeah. All of those, all of those areas linked to um, our main interceptor sewer and Tahuna wastewater treatment plant. Um, uh, so what we're, what we're trying to do broadly is free up capacity in that large infrastructure by addressing the localised issues in North East Valley, Anderson's Bay, Kaikoura Valley. Um, but that, that, um, growth capacity uh, restriction uh, that is, is related to that particular problem. So we're investing heavily in trying to treat all of the sources of the... Um, uh, it's important to note that under normal conditions, so not rainfall conditions, um, the, the sewers retain capacity for, to be able to accommodate most growth scenarios. Mm. Um, uh, it's just under those wet weather events where, where we start to struggle. So we're trying to target that and, and take that element out of, the, um, out of the equation. So does that mean once this work is completed and new pipes and infrastructure is done, that we might have some more capacity in North Dunedin? Correct. Great. When is that hope to be completed? Uh, we will know how successful we've been with that program in 18 months um, okay. uh, and so I won't be able to promise that growth will open up to all areas in mm -hmm. 18 months time but that, that there might be an opportunity to relook at that then um, if not it will also give us the ability to forecast out the next program of works over the next five to ten years um, and that'll that'll again give us an indicator of when those um, uh, when we might be able to open up those areas for more growth. So would that go in the LTP and say that we now expect there could be more capacity so we could change, I think at the moment it's 45 square metres per bedroom, so that could then change in the area, could it? Is that? it yeah, it could. And obviously that's the, the wastewater uh, capacity element is, is one piece of the puzzle for, for our planning teams and all of that sort of stuff, But because right. I'm sure there's more that drives that 45 square metre rate. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of the wastewater restriction, we'll be working really hard to um, make sure that, that uh, that's removed as soon as it can be. Great. Well, that would be really good for North Dunedin. Um, one more question. I know a few years ago there was issues some people were talking to me about with lead in their pipes. Do you know if we've got any, what percentage of pipes still have lead? 
Uh, I don't know what percentage. Um, we, wherever we do uh, come across a lead jointed, um, uh, a lead pipe that has the lead, um, uh, if it is a lead pipe, we remove it and replace it. Mm -hmm. um, this, this happens very infrequently. I can't recall a time in the last two years. Um, uh, where we find a lead jointed pipe, if that lead is exposed to the water, um, then we look at cutting that out and replacing it as well. But that's, um, uh, again, happening very infrequently. There's a large program through the late 80s, early 90s and 2000s to remove all of the lead pipes out of the city, mm. um, which was pretty comprehensive. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Just on that issue, um, one would assume, though, that any um, and also the majority of galvanised pipes are on private property rather than our central system. Uh, that is true. A, a lot of the time, um, if we've got galvanised pipe in the street, it transfers through to galvanised pipe in the in the property. Um, the and so during that program of work to remove um, galvanised pipe and and lead pipe from the. Um, uh, from the city, we were offering um, uh, a whole bunch of subsidies through different methods to property owners as well to make sure that they got their internal plumbing done. Excellent, thank you. Just other question about the infiltration issue into the storm into the wastewater system that was traversed earlier. Um, well, I think we all understand the need for that work, um, but the downside of stopping that water getting into the sewer pipe is, of course, that you've got more stormwater or groundwater to to control or manage, um, are you confident that the, proce the procedures you're following cope with that associated challenge? Yes, um, yeah, broadly. Um, so we, where we look at suburbs to undertake this kind of work, we look at the stormwater network and um, look at its capacity, how it's how it's operating. Um, typically, if that if there is an issue, we replace that stormwater pipe with an appropriate size. Um, at the same time, we've been taking an approach that is um, street by street. So um, if, uh, if we're in a street doing a wastewater main, then we look at the water main and check if it's got any issues up to a certain threshold, and then we look at the, the stormwater pipe as well. Um, uh, and, and if needs be, get them all replaced at once. Um, uh, so yeah, certainly looking at that, looking at that stuff, I'm, I'm fairly confident we're getting it right. Councillor Elder. I just, I just forgot one question in my barrage of questions, sorry. Mm -hmm. And that is um, related to um, Carmen's question. And, and that is, w what is the planning now that we are a medium growth city around capacity for waste, yeah. well, for the three waters really, and enabling more housing in Dunedin? Yes. Um, so we... Obviously, um, growth forecasts and um, uh, and and real growth within the city have been a sort of an emerging trend over the last little while, um, and we've we have gone back to the drawing board in terms of uh, all of our assumptions and um, uh, methods of um, looking at infrastructure options for 2GP, um, and and had, had a look at that again in advance of any appeals and, and that sort of thing. Um, we've we spent quite a bit of uh, time and, and money with consultants to revise those things and make sure that we have got those assumptions right um, and with a view to trying to uh, trying to accommodate more growth within the city. Um, in the past, um, obviously growth was a, uh, a driver, um, a, a driver but a, a little bit further down the list in terms of all of the other um, matters that we've been dealing with. Um, it's, it's now come up a little bit and we're just um, working out how, how we're going to adjust our infrastructure plans to accommodate that. I think we've exhausted all the questions. I just have one, um, which to follow up from Councillor Gary's one about, um, and your answer about, is it Beaconsfield Road in Portobello? I think that's the one you took us to see, and that's three properties affected, and it was about 80 metres of new pipe, right? Yes. Could you tell the committee how much that work cost? Uh, it was about 600,000. Yeah. So I think you're recognising then that it's a, we, we could be facing quite a substantial amount of spending in the future around this particular problem. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, do I have a mover that we note the three wars activity report, Councillor Benson Pope, second to Council Hall? Um, do you want to speak to the, anybody I want to speak to this report? Okay, then all those in favour of accepting, noting the report? 
against. Very good carry. Thank you. Item 6, Transport Activity Report for the two quarters ending December 31st. Welcome, Mr. Sergeant. Um, and I want to introduce everybody to um, Janine Benson, who's taken over the role as transport manager last week. Um, still got time to run away if you want. Um, <laughs> um, given that Janine has only just arrived, um, Nick's going to actually take this. Um, any questions anybody has to answer? Any questions? Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. Um, it was reported to us. Uh, as part of the annual plan that there have been some contract changes that have moved the NZTO funding or funding, our funding from parks in respect of street trees to your neck of the woods, so to speak. Um, but when I look on page something, uh, paragraph four, paragraph three about um, what the transport activity does, I don't see trees anywhere, street trees. That is an accident, or have I misunderstood where that funding is now going? Through the chair, I'll answer that one. So this is an um, activity report for the last six months. The transfer oh, of... Predates the, the transfer? Yeah, the transfer is first That's fine. We'll see you next time then. But, yeah, that's Thank right. you very much. I'm sure it comes to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> that was very slick. <laughs> Councillor Lord? Uh, yeah, now... I've, I have a question. I'm not sure if this will go to you, Nick, or to um, Simon. Uh, yeah, Simon. Thank you. But your name is in. Had a memory block. Um, but it's it's relating to the new maintenance contracts, and um, Sorry. I, I guess I was here sitting in Councillor Raddick's chair in 2010 to 2013, where we were dealing with the best contract and best practice in the world, and then um, post floods in 2015, we were dealing with the most duplicitous contractor and we couldn't get rid of them quick enough and now I would just have a concern that um, we give a contract or are we are negotiating a contract for 10 years and I just um, I'm wondering what are the reasons why we would look at that long a term of contract is that because we get savings that are accumulated over 10 years or is that do we run a risk uh, there's a number of reasons. So um, a, a lot of it's to do around with the investment of plant, and so Councillor Hall might be able to help me out here, is that, um, for example, an asphalt plant costs a contractor uh, millions of dollars, and uh, contractors are looking for return on investment through their all their vehicle fleet, their diggers, their the whole work. So uh, if... <coughs> If, if we as a city can um, give certainty of that kind of investment for a long term, they can spread the cost of that equipment and plant out over a longer period. But, but that's not to say if they're not performing uh, and, and meeting um, our community's expectations, the levels of service that we require, we can't get rid of them. So there are uh, KRA key result areas and key performance indicators that the contract will be measured against. And uh, if they continue to underperform, then we have a mechanism of exiting the contract uh, in time, but I mean, all within the contractual bounds of the tender that's gone out. Yep. And also just note on, and it's his contract value for money, uh, verse 12, uh, not verse, um, point 12, whatever, paragraph 12, it talks about. Um, Results in this area continue to be acceptable. Claims have been made accurate with a robust contracting process in place to ensure payment is only made when the work is completed to an acceptable standard. And then it follows, it says, this remains the most effective method of ensuring specifications are understood and completely delivered, consistently delivered. Now, I'm just wondering, can we, um, I realise the report is about the past, but going forward, can we be absolutely certain that new contracts will be operating on that basis where someone is monitoring and seeing that the work's done properly before payment is made? Yeah, well, the, the new contract um, looks to create more of a partnership model, so and we'll move to that kind of model over time where, our, at the moment, the current contract's set up 
under a lump sum. And so uh, that incentivises contractors to work in certain areas and do certain areas quite well because there's better margin in those areas at the detriment of other areas where their margin's not quite as good. Uh, and over time, they kind of work out where margin's good and not better and move resources around. Uh, we want to transition away from this lump sum type approach to a measure and value approach where you get paid for the work that you do. Um, and 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 that, that will start moving us away from the carrot and stick approach at the moment where we... Uh, you know, we, we give you some money if you do your job well, or we uh, not wrap you over the knuckles of the stick if you don't do your job well. Um, and, but that'll take us some time to transition to that model. And, and then the resource is, is more about um, using the resource to work out where we should spend the money on the network, and we're collaborating to say this is this is the right time and the right place to invest some money in the network here. Um, and rather than a whole lot of resources running around just monitoring quality, so we want to get to a place where those resources that are monitoring quality, we actually have trust that the contractor is going out there and doing what they said <coughs> they're going to do. Um, and, and we use those resources to um, program the network, Look at forward planning works, that kind of stuff. So it's a kind of long winded answer, isn't it? <laughs> I guess I guess everything what you said makes sense, excepting my query was more specifically perhaps that people get paid for work that's done as opposed to get paid for work that they haven't done. And, yeah, so and initially the contract structured so it'll be measure and value with the auditing and say 10, 20% of the auditing you pay, we we'll want to build trust with the contractor that we go out and audit and uh, uh, and, and the contractor's done what they said they were going to do and there is, they're doing their own auditing and their own uh, internal QA so that we don't need QA on top of QA. Uh, it's something that I kind of wrestle with in the industry. We, particularly on vertical builds, you know, we have... Um, QA plans and then we have QA on the contractor's side and we have QA on the consultant side and we have QA on the client side and we've got a, an army of QA staff um, but yet uh, there's still a number of issues in the industry, uh, you know, the Fletcher reinforcing steel and the Chinese steel coming over was an industry with armies and armies of QA uh, and not getting any uh, tangible outcomes for all of that QA. If I might phrase it another way, I guess the, the question I'd like to see is ultimately that we are responsible for seeing that the job's paid and therefore we should be the people assessing that it's done properly rather than having um, someone else telling us that they've done a job properly because there is a difference, do you know what I mean? That's yeah, what yeah there is, and there is elements of it, I guess, what I'm saying is that over time we want to move to a place where the, we have confidence that the contractor's QA is robust and we don't need to have the QA on top of QA on top of QA. But, but there will always certainly be an element of some QA. It's about managing the investment of the QA resource. I, I would okay. be hopeful in time, uh, and this might be two or three or four years out, that uh, where we might have three or four people doing QA, we have one or two. Yeah. Can you just um, tell people what QA stands for? Oh, sorry. Qu quality assurance. <laughs> uh, Sandy gives me a hard time for the jargon all the time. <laughs> Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Drew. <clears throat> I've got three questions about the Peninsula Connection. And I note on um, item 22, it talks about where that's up to and there's some exciting developments. I wondered, are there any plans, given this next stage is about to start, are there any plans for comms to the community just to remind them about 
you know, how we got to this point, because we do have people arriving in the community that weren't part of the journey to get here and who don't remember that the community agreed to multi roadworks on that road. Are there plans for some comms? And I'm not sure who I'm directing the question to, Mr Sargent or yourself, Mr Drew. I'll take that one as well. Uh, no, that's a good point. Look, majority of the comms have been about what's happening now and what's happening in the future, uh, and there hasn't been a great deal on the journey that we've taken to get to this point. I think that's a good idea. I'll, I'll take that up. Because the people who know the journey have no problem with it, but the people who've arrived perhaps do. Um, second one was on Waitangi Day. Some of us um, were in the bus on the way to Otako, and we passed by a section of road uh, quite near to um, Otaka Marae, near the fisheries. That's not part of the funded section. It's, be, it's out of, of that package because it ranked very low in terms of the business case. Um, and, and I know I've been assured that, that uh, transport staff are, are looking for other funding. As we get closer to the end of the funded project, um, can you update me on progress um, to find other funding sources to complete those final bits of work? So, so the other uh, funding sources we're looking at are just general renewals. So we go through and do a reseal. Uh, we can look at extending the shoulder at the same time. Uh, but uh, there is no that I'm aware of. Mr Sargent might be able to... Uh, put some more detail on no more additional NZTA funding for the project, so it'll be um, out of existing council budgets to deliver those outcomes. And are we confident we'll be able to do that, to finish the project? Uh, I'm not across the detail. I know some areas will be um, not easy, but it'll be... Um, uh, doing a resale will be a way of doing it, but to deliver separated cycleways uh, I haven't seen any kind of concept designs and costs around that, just the talk of uh, extending the shoulder during a reseal to create a space for cyclists. And my final question is around uh, confidence that the health and safety issues that were experienced last year on the um, city section of the uh, roadworks where we had a couple of accidents so we're confident that that's been addressed by the contractor such that you know will people the people working on the road will go home safely at the end of each day for this next section as much as we we can tell yeah that's right well health and safety is something that we never stop uh, looking at and continually improving so the contractor has put some new measures in place and you may or may not have seen the scaffolding along um, the edge of the seawall recently uh, and uh, we DCC uh, also um, sort of stepping up our uh, level of commitment. So we've had an independent audit look at the um, site recently and uh, we will continue to go out there and audit ourselves and make sure. But, but yes, everyone's committed to everyone going home safely each day. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Vandivis. Um, thank you. Uh, item 6 on page 27 talks about a, uh, th that uh, at the time of writing the report a preferred supplier had been identified. Can you tell us who that the preferred supplier is now? No, we're still at the ends of uh, tender negotiations and the, uh, the procurement report will go to the tenders board on Wednesday. Uh, so if that is ratified on Wednesday, I'll be able to notify Council after Wednesday. Great, thank you. And on item 8, it talks about the, uh, the, the new maintenance contract uh, that, that you're still finishing off, um, having a stronger focus on sustainability in line with the corporate policy of Council becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Um, is this Council becoming neutral by 2030 uh, really just an aspirational idea, a bit like the zero waste idea that we had a decade ago and still haven't done? Uh, well, it's an aspirational goal that was set by Council and staff are working hard to do all we can to meet that goal. Is there, in fact, really anything you can do given that you've got transportation that's still fossil fueled, you've got asphalt which is all fossil fueled, 
in fact, everything you do is fossil fueled. Um, um, Councillor Vanderbus, I think the chief wants to answer that question. Um, so, uh, 2030 is coming upon us fast. There's no doubt that um, for the staff thinking about being zero carbon by 2030, rather did amp up thinking about what we would have to actually do, uh, not only here at the council in terms of leading by example with ourselves, but also um, as a city. Uh, so all of those initiatives basically uh, have to be um, a really pretty clear signal about what would be required in the annual plan, for, uh, in the 10 year plan. So you'll be getting quite a lot of information about this over the next few months as, st as staff start to come up with things, both for ourselves, but also for the city. So you've got a balance of are reducing carbon emissions, but there are some things we do that you're simply never going to be able to replace them. So both reducing carbon emissions and also offsets. We'll be having discussions about the relative balance of both of those things and what's what's doable and what's not uh, over annual plan. My question really was that in the transportation space, this is a transportation activity report, is in fact there anything that we can actually do to become carbon neutral by 2030? And I think that's a discussion for the 10-year plan when the various options get bought. So there'll be, as I say, a, a mix of things we can do to reduce carbon emissions, but also things we can do to offset carbon emissions. That'll be a discussion for the 10-year plan work, that, that balance. There's sort of small steps that the contract takes along the way, noting that it's a bigger, broader issue. Mm -hmm. But just one example is the preferred tenderer has committed to, uh, has some more jargon, um, LMPVs, light maintenance patrol vehicles, their entire fleet, I think there's seven of them to manage the network will be electrified. Um, and, and so some of the, uh, I think it was 15% on sustainable carbon zero type outcomes and uh, the preferred tender are scored highly in that space because they were electrifying their fleet. Thank you very much for that. Um, moving on to the graph on page 29, there's a pretty severe dip around April and then May of last year. Can you um, let us know what that was about in terms of the um, monthly CSA response times? Do you know that one? Oh, yeah, no, so I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I'll find out and come back to you if you like. Uh, if, if you could, um, I personally had a number of issues with CSA myself then as well, wondering what might have gone wrong to affect all of CSA or whether it was just something specific to transportation. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, and thank you once again for a good report, and welcome, Ms. Benson. Transport's an easy portfolio. Um, I have a couple of questions, and, and uh, Councillor Vandervis hit on possibly my first one. It was about uh, point eight under the road maintenance contract. I just underlined stronger focus on sustainability and was going to ask for some examples. You gave the one about the light electric vehicles. Any other things that spring to mind? Um, has if it's not, don't. Uh, well, one other thing is there is a, I can't remember the community group, but it was to do with possum trapping. And, um, and in their normal duties, they would, were offering to <laughs> lay possum traps on their way out to a number of sites and then manage the, the results of the trap. Um, so that was another one that springs to mind. It's not carbon zero, but it was a kind of social community outcome. Well, I, certainly I'll be very interested moving forward to, to, hear, to hear what further measures uh, maybe will be in place. The other uh, point um, is around number 27 and the LED streetlight installation. And I speak sort of at a personal level here, having had a temporary replacement outside my house that seems akin to the North Star. Um, the how, how is that progressing, the delays, and where, where do we sit now with that LED program? Um, so my understanding is the project is uh, slightly behind schedule at the moment. The contractor has some resourcing issues, uh, and but is working hard to address those issues. Uh, and 
staff are still confident that we can deliver the program by the time the NZTA funding window closes. Do you want to add something? Yeah, may I just add something there which goes to uh, uh, the question you're asking. We are, as we start to replace uh, incandescent bulbs with LED bulbs and the incandescent bulbs which fail, we will get these spot replacements um, and those will appear brighter until we can get the central management system in place to adjust the lighting levels for the system. So, at, so other cities that have had this rollout have experienced this uh, and so when we get the full system working we will then be able to um, uh, sort the light levels out because it will appear bright and unusual to you, um, but that's because it's probably operating at a higher bore than it needs to at the moment. <laughs> Council Houlihan. A lot of my questions have actually been asked, which is... <laughs> The trouble coming a bit later, but um, yes, I had I had that as well around the focus of what were some of the things we're going to do for sustainability, and that quite a bit of that has been asked. I also wondered who the new contractor would be, and so it sounds like by maybe Wednesday we can know that. Is that the case? Will you email us that, or something? that would be good to know? Yeah, I can do that. Possible. Yep, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, I had an issue around um, just with the new contractor what um, you know I just wondered what sort of things are being promised in the negotiations for what they'll be able to do I because it's a 10-year contract it is a long contract um, and obviously I assume it'll be covering some of the things in our LTP but are you able to say what some of those major projects are and I'm particularly interested to know you know Obviously, uh, what are we talking to them about around the George Street upgrade? Uh, no, so the George Street upgrade project is a separate contract. Uh, so so that, that won't be done by this new contractor? No. It'll no, be done by someone else? So this, this contract is predominantly about the maintenance of the transport network, oh. including for boundary to boundary, so including vegetation, footpaths, curb and channel, um, the roads, trees, <laughs> bus shelters, signs, that kind of stuff. So some of the, uh, th there is a mechanism to add in some three waters renewal type work. So if they're going through and doing a rehab, um, we now have a mechanism to add uh, a pipe renewal at the same time where, where there is efficiencies in doing so but predominantly it's a maintenance delivery contract. Okay, and does that um, inner city upgrade come under this report at all? Uh, is it? The, there I was think it's under planning and environment, because it's, is that right Nick? It's a planning environment update, isn't it? Right, so there's nothing, so there's no point asking about that here, okay. I had another question around, um, yeah, I had noted the April, I was curious to know, but you're going to come back with that. So I've got here TMP audits. Um, can I just clarify what they are? I've got, I just put that down, I wasn't sure what they um, Whenever anyone needs to work in a road, they need to have a temporary traffic management plan. Right. Um, and then part of the function we provide is to go out and audit the temporary traffic management plans that are in place yes. to see that they're complying and doing what they said that they would do. Oh, okay, thank you very much. On um, page 30, it's got our streets. I just wonder what streets is that referring to? I can tell you, it's escaped me at the moment, but there, <laughs> basically there are, there are um, three streets that have been packaged up with our maintenance uh, program to um, look at. Uh, we did a consultation on our streets a, a while ago, and there are three streets that have been packaged up so that we can look at crossing points and uh, They must be reasonably sort of significant because it was 700 They are, they're on yeah. our arterial network and they've just escaped me oh, at the moment. So I'll, I'll provide you a note to tell you exactly what okay. streets they are. And um, just to clarify, can, um, what is the city school cluster? 
um, the city school cluster uh, is the uh, cluster of schools up on the hill behind us here. All right. um, Arthur Street, uh, Otago right. Boys yes. High School, etc. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. And I think Latch is on the... Oh, no, that's later, isn't it? Not, uh, that's fine. Comes under waste. Thank you. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm delighted to see the whole raft of safety improvements, uh, in particular the ones around schools that have just been referred to. Much and all, there's a few punters out there in the community who don't like things you can notice and see. <coughs> but I won't dwell on that. But I, I've... Um, I've had a lot of concerns raised with me recently about general speed across the city, vehicle speed across the city. Um, I'm not in a position to, to know whether um, the concern that's been conveyed to me or my own observations of what I consider as excessive speed and bad driver behaviour are real or different. Do we do any monitoring um, of actual speeds in, across the city in various environments? and? Is there much policing of vehicle speed within the city by the constabulary? Do you know? Um, two parts to that question. Uh, first of all, um, do we do monitoring of speeds? Yes, we do. We have a regular uh, traffic counting program, and part of that is monitoring the speeds. So uh, we monitor what's called the uh, 85th percentile speed. Um, so, for example, when you see tube counts around the city, as well as counting vehicles, they're actually counting the speed that the vehicles travel across those tube counts. Part of the normal non-financial reporting at, in the committee round, I assume? Uh, we've never reported that to you. It's generally used uh, uh, for officers for technical assessment of what's going on. But that would be helpful for us to know. So perhaps we could ask for a look at that on a trial basis anyway for the next reporting round. Do you want to bring it up for matters arising at the end? To Certainly, yep. That? Policing, yes. Um, uh, uh, DCC staff and the police meet regularly to identify the um, policing uh, the, the policing matters in the city. We don't have direct influence over where police uh, allocate their resources, but we certainly raise um, matters that we would like uh, attention uh, devoted to with them. That's half the answer. Do you know if there's any policing done, speed policing done within there the city? There is actually some speed policing done in the city, yes, but I don't know where and I don't know when. Thank you. If, if I could just follow up the Council Benson Pope's question, is that is that activity carried out in the Road Safety Action Committee? Is that where the interface is done? Yes, you're, you're right in that we would uh, raise it as part of the work of that committee. And that's Councillor Radich is on that committee? Yeah, yeah correct. Councillor Elder. Thank you for your report. And I've got um, <coughs> three questions again. Um, just with the um, purchasing um, of contracts, do you use the um, new purchasing offices to help with um, create, you know, getting um, bids for contracts? Is that part of their role? There are two ways that we source uh, supplies. There's the open contract, open market approach, and there's the uh, market approach through our long-term engineering services panel. So we use a mix of approaches. So in the, um, putting out those contracts, you, do you put the sustainability goals in those contracts? It's usually part of the marking criteria and, 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 and is some of the weighting in the consideration of the evaluation. So do we, um, what, what I'm trying to get at is, um, are we trying to directly influence our, you know, all the providers to move towards a more, more sustainable model and do they get an opportunity to change their behaviour to, to go for a contract? Uh, I believe that the answer to that question is yes, we are trying to influence the market. Thank you. Um, the, other, the other thing is, um, it's great to see the mud tank cleaning and, and, and I realise there was a slowdown with the asbestos being discovered. Um, 
Can you tell us a bit more about what happens just before a big rain event? Because um, just the assurance that um, you know the, that the action plan around, say, the big rain event last week, for example. Uh, okay, I can take that. Uh, yeah, so there are now and hot spots across the city. So uh, effectively, the three waters and the uh, transport teams become aligned in uh, preparation for a wet weather event, uh, and that hot spot list uh, contractors go out and clean screens, uh, you know, stormwater intakes, uh, clean mud tanks that are just the tops of mud tanks that are known to kind of accumulate debris. Uh, so over the past we've uh, learnt a lot during these flood events so we keep a register of where there were issues and we attend to those issues before the, uh, attend to those sites before the weather event occurs. And have you noticed any changes because of that kind of uh, regime do you think? Well it's it's difficult to say I mean uh, yeah we, we think they're having benefits but each wet weather event's a little bit different, different and yeah. we could clean all the tops of the mud tanks you know for, for a week before and you have a really significant event it still overwhelms the system yeah but but every step we take further mitigates the risk of having uh, surcharging and surface flooding I certainly no noticed the increase at, before the event and I think also the the, you can't underestimate how people feel a lot safer when they see something being done, even if there was a big rain event and you couldn't do anything more. Um, but, you know, I just congratulate you guys for doing that. Um, I think that was it. Um, oh, that was the other question. Um, we made a resolution a while ago just to do an uh, audit of the parking in the central city and I was just wondering where that was at. Uh, yes, we're presently um, working to uh, I scope the work programme and actually procure the supplier for that uh, work programme as we speak. Yeah. Councillor Staines. With the um, mud tank cleaning, I assume the number of mud tanks, because we're the third year now where we're tracking lower than the previous year in mud tank cleaning, my assumption is that we now have a better idea of which mud tanks need more frequent cleaning, and therefore the total number we're cleaning is less. Is that correct? Yes, uh, so I've sent a few emails around in the past uh, at Councillor um, Van Vissel's request and uh, a lot of it is checking and knowing that they don't need to be cleaned mm -hmm. um, and so this is a reflection of a generally a well this year is a reflection of asbestos in the mud tanks slowing us down but generally it's a reflection of what needs to be cleaned as opposed to cleaning everything for the sake of cleaning it. The other question with that graph that I had is it does have a performance complying, percentage complying, and there's only the target but there's no measure of what we're actually achieving. Is, is that just something that's been left out? Yeah, no, I think that I tried to question and get rid of that line. It's been there since I um, have been with DCC. So there, there used to be this, I think this might be the history, this compliance level of cleaning 95% of them, but you, you didn't need to climb, clean 95% of them because there could be some mag tanks in the city that never need cleaning because they don't accumulate debris. Uh, I, I, I need to uh, understand what that number there is for because it doesn't make any sense to me either. It, well, my reading of it is it says is the percentage conforming mud tank, so I'd assume that's um, if we audit tanks that have, they, that have been cleaned by the contractor to make sure that they have been cleaned, that we find 95% of them are definitely clean, but that's what it would indicate to me, but it doesn't seem to have any... No, well, the scale's yeah. not right on the left-hand side of the earth. Yeah, no, I take your point. I'll yep. follow it up okay. for the next one. Um, I had a question around um, paragraph 27, which is the LED street lighting. 
When we were looking at LED street lighting, there was comment made that properties that had a problem with stray light could, under the, with the new LEDs, could request a shield to be fitted to, to specifically cut down the light crossing their boundary. So the question I've got is, is that correct? And if it is, when you're rolling out street lights in, a, in an area, do you put a letter around the residents to say, we're fitting the street lights, um, do you have a problem with stray light now? And would you want a shield fitted so that we actually can do it at the same time rather than bringing a gang back and climbing up to put a shield on a light because someone's requested So, for instance, Councillor Walker's problem now with a very bright LED light, could he ring up and say, could I have a shield fitted to cut down the stray light to my property? Uh, I'll try and answer that question as best I can. The, the shorter answer is to it is yes, but only once the rollout reaches the road in question, as I alluded to earlier, we're in this in-between phase where we've had failures. We're putting up LEDs to replace them quickly and then they're causing these effects. But nevertheless, uh, if, we've got an un if there are other undue issues, they could ring us up to draw our attention to them um, and, and let us know. But uh, there's this um, in-between phase at the moment, so some... Making it clear at the table, Councillor Walker isn't seeking any favouritism. No, but you, if you're experiencing it, someone else will experiencing it, et cetera. Um. Dr. Radich. Yes, back to the question of road safety. Um, I note uh, the school safety project in Arthur Street in particular has a series of consistent speed bumps along it. Uh, that regulate the speed of traffic along that street in front, right in front of the schools, in particular Boys High. But as you go around uh, Maori Road, there's a, a number of speed bumps there, which, uh, um, in my view and the view of many people that have mentioned it to me, are not road safety improvements. They're quite aberrant uh, shape and size. And in fact, they could be considered less safe for the vehicle occupants who get thrown around when they go over them and speeds have to be reduced right down to about 10 kilometres an hour to get over them. And certainly less safe for emergency service vehicles who may, uh, might well no longer use that road because uh, perhaps a hosp uh, an ambulance, someone would be thrown around in the back of that ambulance and it'd be far slower to get along that road. And in fact, school buses, uh, which would be using that road to service boys high amongst other, the other schools in that area, uh, we're much less inclined to use that route. And so they'd be... Um, the Mary Road Councillor, be, you've got to get so to a question. Yeah. Yes, so the question is, um, how does those aberrant speed bumps fit with the road safety plan? It actually uh, fits in a, with a question that was asked earlier when we monitor our speeds in the city. If speeds are, are high on a particular road, we, they, it then draws our attention to the fact that there is a speed problem. Uh, Mary Road, which you've alluded to, is a significant uh, walking route for kids coming to and from school, and we identified a speed problem, and the solution to that speed problem is uh, treatment, um, because people don't conform to the speed limit voluntarily. Um, so that's the history uh, of those particular treatments and in common with many of the other treatments that you will see, they are designed to slow speeds. So why are the speeds on that section of Murray Road so much, or uh, regulated to be so much slower than the speeds right outside the schools on Arthur Street? I think it's a uh, pick up uh, another part of your question. I think you can't do everything all at once, mm -hmm. so you have to have a program and you have to uh, uh, pick your uh, best streets first. The other thing to bear in mind, which goes to the other part of your question, is that um, not every street has a, a road hump and there are other streets that you can use if you don't want to experience a uh, road hump. So um, it comes back down to choice, I suppose. 
So no, that's not quite my question, sorry. The, why are the speed humps on Maori Road uh, regulating the speed? Why are they there to regulate the speed so much lower than the speed humps that regulate the speed outside the schools? So what I'm saying is outside the schools, there's a fairly consistent level, uh, there's a fairly consistent type of speed bump throughout Dunedin, and I'm thinking perhaps down Victoria Road and, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, other places, they're really consistent in the speed you can go across, but those ones on Maori Road are much slower. So why do you want the speed so much lower on Maori Road? I can uh, partly answer that as I spoke to the um, safety team leader last week. I haven't updated Nick on this discussion. So the speed bump is a standardised speed bump. It's not. It's straight from the NZTA draw. Uh, the uh, safety team leader is going to go and have a look at it, and he has asked some. Uh, staff uh, in the department that rode motorcycles to have a look at it in particular and drive over it. Uh, he he thought that one of the reasons it, sa it seems more violent than it should is that there's a, a downward slope into the speed hump and it might need to be adjusted because it's designed for a flat road, not a slope onto a slope. Anyway, so staff uh, are going to um, audit those particular speed humps uh, over the next week or so and just make sure that they are not creating another safety hazard. Okay, and last question is, uh, so are the AA and emergency services and various transport operators consulted with the design of the various road safety improvements around the town? Usually the police and fire and emergency and ambulance are all on our standard stakeholder consultation list. Uh, and the reason why I asked that is when I was uh, with the AA meeting recently, uh, they felt they hadn't been consulted over various ones. Not the AA, uh, but mm. the fire and emergency services, yes. Right, so next question, do you think the AA should be involved, seeing as they, are, they represent 45,000 road users? around Otago? Um, yes, I mean, it's always an open question as to who and uh, how, who you involve and when, and do you consult narrowly or do you <coughs> consult widely? Um, happy to review that. Councillor Hall. With your, your new contract to the new contract, they're responsible for the water table, culverts and everything in the actual road that looks after the stormwater system or just the... Yeah, the road water tables, yes, so boundary to boundary is the new contract's responsible for. Because the biggest problem I see is the build up of vegetation and the head of all those culverts hasn't been cleaned out for years, a lot of them. But, um, as yeah, long as that's covered. And a compliant mud tank. Is that a clean mud tank? Uh, not clean, so there's a, there's a, a, a certain tolerance of build-up required, and then once you get over that yeah. tolerance, yeah. or we're getting close to tolerance, it gets programmed for a clean. Yeah, it used to be, had to be, six years ago, it used to have to be 250 mil below the invert, but before it was compliant. That sounds familiar, but I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Like, Councillor Barker. Councillor Vandermas. Um, on the issue of uh, speed bumps, uh, I think Councillor Raddick does have a point. Um, I can see why you might get a reduction in accidents in these streets, considering I now no longer use Mary Road. Dunbar Street or Rattray Street because of the damage it does to the underside of my car which is a little bit low at the front. Um, every time you go over a speed bump at any speed you get the scrape. The one at Dunbar Street has had so many cars scraping it that in fact if you have a look at the Dunbar Street speed bump as you go in it's nothing but hundreds of serious scrapes that must have damaged a lot of underbellies of a lot of cars. Um, I believe that the, uh, there's just far too many of these and that there's no um, going back from the issue. Um, 
Uh, my question, however, sorry Jim, thank you for indulging me, um, <laughs> is given that your answer has been that you haven't been able to do it all yet and that you have already prevented me from using Dunbar Street, Mary Road and Rattray Street, what streets do you intend preventing me from using next? Uh, what, what's, what's next on the list to have these uh, suspension damaging and underside damaging um, speed bumps on? I don't actually know the answer to that question um, because I don't know the speeds that will, uh, the streets that will reveal themselves to have a speed uh, issue problem as we work through the roads that we're looking at. Okay. All right. Um, my other question goes back to mud tank cleaning, and maybe this is one for Simon. Um, uh, in uh, after the 2015 floods, when a sucker truck was called up from Invercargill because our contractor didn't have one here and hadn't had one here for a whole year, in fact, um, of, of being paid for doing mud tank cleaning. The, the Invercargill contractor told me that what they do in Invercargill is they routinely clean all of the mud tanks. They don't selectively decide which ones really need it. They clean them all. And he said that the real advantage of doing this is that they can do 170 of them a, a day because the sediment doesn't have time to compact and turn to concrete and have to be chipped out with a crowbar. He said they hate coming up here to Dunedin where routine maintenance hasn't been going on for quite some time. And that um, they, can only, they can only clean place, 20 tanks in a day. My question is, have you looked at routinely cleaning all of the tanks as they do in at least some other centres because it can be done much more quickly, uh, much more efficiently and you can be guaranteed then that you will not get the uh, the profusion of little lakes that we get around the and every time we get a decent rainfall. Um, the lake at the bottom of uh, Pine Hill uh, under the overbridge there uh, I've had to drive around many times. Um, uh, the lake that develops just south of Olverston on, on Queen's Drive there has been there so long I've just about decided to name it Lake Olverston uh, because it's a routinely uh, filled up, flooded um, uh, mud tank, admittedly with a lot of uh, foliage around and I can understand why it fills up. Why is it that we don't, like other cities, more routinely clean all our mud tanks and have less of this problem that I haven't seen in any other city? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll take that on advice though and discuss with staff and um, see if there's any kind of underlying reason why we take that proactive, only clean what needs to be cleaned in terms of sediment depth in the sump. Okay, um, could I also ask that you perhaps talk to some of the out-of-town contractors like the uh, people from Invercargill, for instance, who are called up when there's a real problem here? Which Thanks. contractor is the Invercargill contractor? Um, oh, it was water something. Sorry, I can't remember. They, they do all, they've done all the Invercargill ones for many years. I can look it up if, if you like later. Councillor Hulham. <clears throat> uh, my question's already been asked. Thank you. Very much. I just have one quick question about the LED rollout. Um, I thought that um, community boards or communities out on the coastal area had been given a some insurance that we were going to go to a higher number Kelvin light and lower lower number. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> boy, that could have been trouble. Um, are these ones that are being rolled out in Brighton and on the waterfront, those lower Kelvin lights? Uh, as I understand it, the uh, lower Kelvin uh, lights have been reserved to the end of the rollout program, so we're not into the areas that will receive the lower Kelvin lights yet, so places like the peninsula and Waikowiti and Karatani. But Brighton would be considered on the coast, wouldn't it? That's why I, I, was, I, that's, that's why I thought it was unusual to see it on this list in the early rollout. In the original um, resolutions that were adopted by Council, Brighton was not on the second phase rollout list, so it has appeared uh, in the initial rollout. Any further questions? Um, can I have a mover, Councillor Walker? Second to Councillor Hall. 
I just catch him. Do you want to speak to this? Anybody want to speak to this? Councillor Lord. Yeah, look, I'd just like to say that I um, one thing that has um, impressed me, or well, since I came onto council, I guess one of the things I've um, I've always thought about was road safety, and it is something I have had a number of calls about, particularly past schools. Now, probably in the main road and out in the country, I often um, probably test the speed limits a bit, but in town and around schools, I certainly think uh, it's a time for absolute taking paying attention. And it just, I'm really pleased to see it. I know this council made a decision a few months or a few years ago <coughs> to, to spend more money on. Um, on, on these areas, and, and we've looked at it, but I just I'm really pleased to see another five and a half million in late December that was activated by NZTA doing more funding, and I just um, perhaps slightly different to Councillor Raddick, I just have a view that whatever they have around schools, whether it's a speed hump, if it slows me down and slows other people down, it's a good thing. So just um, keep up on the good work there. Thank you, Councillor Vandervis. I agree with Councillor Lord regarding a school awareness and I think what's been done at Kaikara Valley High School uh, with the flashing lights and whatever to make especially people not familiar with the area aware that it is a school area has certainly been positive. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the speed bumps however um, I'm not that convinced uh, are being uh, really uh, effective and I know that I get a lot of um, anxiety mail from residents who have a particularly uh, negative view of them, especially in, if, if they appear in a, in a route that they use regularly. Um, my view is that we do need to take uh, safety, especially around school areas, uh, uh, much more seriously. Um, and I know that uh, overseas countries I've been at, for instance, there are some places where 15 kilometres an hour is all you're allowed to do around uh, some school areas, especially preschool areas. Um, uh, but in terms of, of road safety, I think we need to remember that the often quoted high uh, accident rate that we have in Dunedin is a direct result of our peculiar demographic of having a lot of very old people and a lot of very young people by way of students here. And since these old and young demographics uh, invariably attract a much higher accident rate, that uh, quoting our high accident rate in Dunedin and therefore the need to throw more money at it is um, uh, something potentially of a, of a, of, of a fraught hope. Uh, we are always going to have a higher accident rate and I think uh, that we need to accept that the causes for that are not a lack of uh, mountainous speed bumps around the city. Um, we would still like to be able to get around the city without damage to vehicles, suspensions or, or bones. Thank you. Councillor Gary. It's very easy to rationalise things that don't suit us personally, um, but what I uh, would say is that uh, what comes to mind is a significant award at one of our uh, our local high schools that's in memory of a young woman that was killed at the age of 14 crossing one of our roads near the schools. So uh, I often, I always think of her when I pass that particular part of the road and um, I really welcome the work that's been done by a transport team on school safety. It won't suit everybody. I've also had some uh, communication from residents and what I find is that people don't necessarily understand the bigger picture. They understand what applies to them and sometimes it's inconvenient and uh, don't necessarily have that bigger picture. I'd like particularly to thank our, thank our safety team whose expertise and professionalism in this uh, has certainly uh, given a good result. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, extraordinary progress uh, in the Peninsula Connection, a, a project that um, was lobbied for by members of our community over many, many years and uh, is hugely welcomed by them. And the inconvenience of a few extra minutes coming to work uh, doesn't matter a jot because you just have to prepare for it. And I've had lots of feedback from the community about uh, the extraordinary progress that has been made. Um, they certainly care about the safety of the people doing the job and that's why I asked those questions earlier. But uh, great progress. I look forward to hearing around funding, further detail around funding for those extra pieces because the community will not celebrate um, in a gala opening until the whole jolly project's finished. Um, I, I'll try to be brief at the end of this. <clears throat> um, 
I think it's funny, we've concentrated on everything that's here, then we've concentrated mostly on the speed bumps that are around the school districts. I would say that this is a, a situation of competing demands. Um, it, if, if everybody remembers, it was the principals of those schools and the schools and the boards of those schools that have asked for this work to be done. Um, that also includes George Street Normal is looking for it. Um, out on the Waikato Coast, where I'm on that community board, the Waitati School has asked for it. It's a common theme now to ask for more safety around these school zones. Um, I also note Councillor Benson Pope's point about the amount of speed in certain parts of the city and I do think that under the New Zealand culture um, and a fairly low level of policing rate, um, just expecting people to stay to a certain speed in an environment just because we set the limit may or may not achieve an outcome. So speed, humps and other activities like that are directly designed to get an outcome without requiring policing. I do note that um, the humps on Maori Road um, are perceived and I've driven it myself to have a check, has been particularly high for some reason. So I note too that the staff have listened to that and are going out and reassessing it. And I think that this is a journey where there's a little bit of to and fro to be done. Um, it's not, and, and then for the outcome should be achievable where you can save your suspension by going down to the speed you're expected to go to in that area. Um, unless you've got a really old car, I guess. So if there's no more speakers, I move that the committee notes the transport activity. Oh, yes, so those, should we vote on it? Those in favour? Against? Passed. Thank you very much. Oh, right at the very end, I'll ask for matters arising. on that one. Okay, item 7, Parks and Recreation Activity for the period ending 31st January 2020. <coughs> Ms Graham, Mr West, welcome. Um, do you want to speak to your report? Very good. Questions? Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I wonder if uh, in paragraph 2B, the Hamlet paragraph, um, I wonder if someone could explain to me why Predator Free Dunedin has got an acronym um, that's PDF. Or is that bureaucratic dyslexia at work? <laughs> <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> oh, it's a mistake, isn't it? It's a mistake, it's yes. a, I must say, it, it is consistent right throughout yeah, the report. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. That's my fault, sorry. PFD. I don't know that. I wouldn't have corrected that, would it? Councillor Walker. Um, yep, thank you. Um, as previous two reports, thank you for a very good report. I think I have three questions. Um, one of them actually uh, is similar to uh, Councillor Benson Pope's. Uh, question. I don't understand the sentence uh, in aquatics, the very last sentence, uh, number 20. Is it just that the sentence hasn't been completed? It's missing the word plan. I noticed that oh. earlier, Councillor. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. Um, that out. Okay, the second thing is um, the... I'm really delighted to see the, the weekend uh, ranger positions at the Botanic Gardens. How's that working out? Uh, good, we've just recruited the second one and um, feedback's good. So it's very popular with visitors, very, po very popular with staff. And um, from a health and safety point of view, I'm really pleased that we've been able to get those. So thank you to Council for voting for that last uh, term. Yep. Yeah, it's great to hear. And final question is um, number 12, the, the review for the Botanic Gardens. How, what's the timeline on the completion of that report? So um, you'll note um, as well, Councillor, that we've also um, started, I'm just trying to find the paragraph for you. Uh, we're also starting a piece of work, it's uh, paragraph 21. Suddenly uh, we've started the commencement of the strategic plan for the BG and we're aligning those two pieces of work together because they very much set together. So um, hopefully within the next um, 12 months yeah, so it's, it's a priority piece of work. The, the BG is, uh, was one of the highest on the reserve management plan, um, less to be done. Yeah. Councillor Barker. 
Thank you for your report. Um, the Wellers Rock, I just have a question around that. Is there a timeline around the comms? Because it's the middle of the Freedom Camping um, time, I just sent a picture to Sandy of a very large camper van parked on the, the beach there, and it's in wiki camps, and I wondered whether there was communication going on around now to try and no. keep people off that area. Yeah, the, the um, fair point, there probably needs to be more consideration of that as we're right in the middle of the busy period. Um, there is some work um, going on around how we can increase car parking capacity on that site to help alleviate that. Um, and there was some discussion about whether they hold off all the work until we did the whole package. But it was felt that um, Marunanga and the community board felt that we needed to make progress. So we've kind of, um, uh, we're, we're, it's a work in progress is the, is the result that we're seeing. So, um, but we're getting some, again, we're getting some good feedback. Um, but obviously it's causing some uh, issues for us as well at this, at this point in the season. Councillor Gary. Well, thanks for a very full report, Mr West. I have a, a question about um, Te Umukuri, uh, Wallace Rock, and of course the Rounanga has been concerned about this for a very long time. Are they happy with, uh, you possibly answered it somewhat, are they happy with where it's got to now and the plans in the long term? Yeah, so they've been part of the working group that's been working on this right from the beginning. Um, and they've been really happy with the proposed solution, which the rocks are uh, obviously a more natural sort of um, piece of work that we can put in there and, and are of course, removable if we need to as well in the future. But uh, they've also been working with us on the, looking at the car parking capacity. So they are pretty pleased. Um, they would like to see um, those vehicles stop using that site mm. as soon as possible. But they've been very supportive. They've been very patient. And they were out there when we were putting the rocks out um, a couple of weeks ago. Great, thank you. And um, Taironi, um, wonderful progress on the resource consent application being lodged by ORC, but I was wondering if you know when are the uh, hearings on the consent? Do you have any knowledge no, of that I at all? I'm no. afraid I don't, don't have that okay. yet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Elder. Thank you for your report and it's great to see the audits coming along and um, the planning coming along. Um, I have a couple of questions. In the tracks planning, um, I use the tracks a lot and a, lo a lot of them have parking places, for example, at the bottom of Nichols where they're overloaded. Is that part of the plan is around enabling um, parking so people can access those tracks? Um, that's a good point. Um, I need to, I'll need to follow up on that. I don't think I, I want to answer that without having a little bit more of a question of the project lead. Um, but it is a really good point. Uh, certainly for some of the tracks that we've been looking at, we're aware that there are significant issues. But are we looking at it consistently as part of the work yeah. programme? I'm not sure, so I need to come back to you on that Because that enables not just domestic people, but also um, tourists. Um, yeah. I went up to Nichols Creek the other day, and um, this guy had a mountain bike on the back of his vehicle, and he was lost. He mm. didn't know where it was. And um, so is also signage part of the package because yeah, lots of people don't critical. know where the tracks are. Yeah, signage is critical um, and we're, um, we're working with comms and marketing and DOC on, on that. It, it's, it's quite complicated. It is. <laughs> um, but we, we are, it's a core part of that project, yes. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, the, and thanks for all the work being done in that area. Um, I see act, sports and active recreation um, project and I note that I went to a sports um, review of, of, of people being involved in score, sports and um, in their report um, they said informal play opportunities and outdoor recreation was a bigger emphasis for the whole community, but particularly for over 13s, where people um, drop off being involved in any sport. Yeah. Um, is there any um, 
thought to having with the project team, you've got DCC, PARS, Event Star, Sport Otago, etc., of having Doc in there or some outdoor recreation group in, the, in that? So, so Doc will be one of the stakeholders when oh, we get cool. work. Uh, the, the, the first project meeting of that group was this morning. Um, so um, Doc will certainly be a key stakeholder. Um, but we're really keen, I was really keen to look at um, having a, a, a primary health care um, yes. uh, input there because uh, we are really keen that to not just focus on sports codes but on activity and physical activity. And, and noting that our um, overarching body in New Zealand is, is pointing that direction as well. Yeah, well, when, when we're presenting to community and culture tomorrow on the playground piece of work, and you'll see that um, some of the concerns around the activity drop-off at age uh, 13 um, is uh, reflected in some of the playground work. So um, that aligns very clearly with the Sport Otago findings and where they're putting their um, emphasis for the coming years. Yes, and the na national body is yeah. emphasising that. Yeah. Hopefully funding goes with it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and thanks for your, all your work in that area. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you. In paragraph 13, um, you talk about beaches, Tomahawk and um, Long Beach in particular. I think we're all familiar with the educational and... Um, uh, the educational methods you're using to mm -hmm. encourage compliance with the mm -hmm. bylaw. Um, you'll <coughs> more tomorrow, of course. Um, but I'm wondering if you've actually carried out the have have there been any um, customers, sorry, residents, drivers fined for breaching the bylaw, or are they still receiving the please don't letter? Please don't letter at this stage. Um, um, What's pleasing, I think, out of all the letters we've sent out, councillor, only one um, one person has been spotted again on a beach. Now, I, either that's because they've been on beaches and we haven't had the rangers or security or nobody's informed on them, um, or um, it's the message is getting through. So um, it's hard to pick that, but only one out of the um, letters that have been sent through thus far a bad repeat. Yeah, I think what you're doing is commendable, and so you know, yeah. um, that's fine. Thank you very much. I mean, obviously, as we move into next season, we'll keep monitoring it. If we continue to see an issue, we, we may move. But I'm very keen to look at a gradual step-by-step -step approach and, and continue to appeal to people's, um, you know, inform them what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it uh, as a first step. Thank you. Councillor Radich. Thank you for a comprehensive report. I just have a question about the freedom camping, because we recently had a complaint about numbers uh, on one particular site, and I have heard from constituents about numbers on other sites as well, where certain sites are getting overloaded. Do we firstly monitor those numbers, and do we post signage limiting numbers in any uh, on, at the sites, and, and thirdly, do we have any kind of policing or enforcement or notification, you know, verbal notification or any other mechanism to control numbers on those sites? No, there's a few questions in there, so if I, if I forget a few, um, come back at me. Um, so um, we do monitor all sites, so and where we get um, notifications from the public. Uh, into our customer services agency as we did this morning because we've had a very bit very busy weekend this weekend mm -hmm. uh, Waitangi weekend is one of our busiest weekends for freedom camping um, and plus we've had a few other factors on our plate in the city so it's all compiled um, which is positive uh, hopefully to, for the economy of the city. Um, so if people ring in to CSA, Community Services Agency, we will ask specifically for um, security and rangers to target those areas um, for a period of time to, until we try to bring it back in, into control. 
Um, do we have the capacity to limit numbers on certain sites? What we've done very successfully with Ocean View in the last 12 months is put concrete sleepers out to better define the parking areas because there was a concern from the community board that it was overcrowding and there were, um, the chair had concerns about health and safety issues with that. So we agreed that we would put concrete sleepers out and that has managed that uh, significantly better this year. Have we done it on all of our sites? No, we haven't, but it is an option for us to look at. Um, it, it's kind of hard. What, we do have rangers. The rangers will point out if, if they feel that people are over parking, as will security. Um, but it is kind of hard if people are arriving in the middle of the night. And they're, they're, uh, Warrington sometimes gets very busy and people double park. And I think there's a potential issue that we continue to need to look at. Yes. Were that, were those, uh, was there another question in there? Well, do we have an, uh, a limitation on numbers and a sign to that effect at various sites? By le by, I mean, Ocean View, a great example. If we put, Now we've got the concrete yes. sleepers, it makes it really clear how many there are. Um, and once they're full, they're full. The other thing that we're using this year, and again, we trialled it with Ocean View, <coughs> is um, we have an app, um, I, I think it's a CamperMate app, uh, that we've installed a camera there that will will collect data on whether it's full or not, so that people that, that are travelling to that site will know before they arrive whether it's full. So hopefully, again, that's uh, people use their initiative and don't think that they can just double park on those sites. And one last question: How are the numbers of uh, uh, resident complaints about freedom camping tracking? Well, it's early in the um, early in the month, the busiest month. February is our busiest month. Uh, March is also very busy, but I think what you saw from presentations last uh, was it last week we presented to you. Um, uh, numbers are up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. So t total numbers are up. Yes. C complaints complaints are, are stable. Hmm. Yeah, they've not gone up in the same rate as the. Complaints have gone up. Infringements have dropped significantly. Yeah, but um, I, I I do expect we'll see a few more complaints after the last busy weekend. Thank you, Councillor Hurlham. Councillor Hurlham. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. Um, I just had a question that, which was sort of raised, touched on slightly before, around well-being. I was at a presentation a wee while ago that some of us other councillors were there as well, where um, New Zealand Sport um, CEO spoke about how they were able to get more funding because they'd focused on well-being and because the government at the moment has goals, you know, to increase the well-being and, of, of course, the well-being budget. And I wondered around the issue of, like, outdoor activities, um, playgrounds, but also the tracks and the walkways. And if it's possible, I mean, we may already be doing this, but to uh, look at funding, um, you know, to apply for some funding for some of these things around... The, the well-being that it can create for our, um, you know, for our citizens. Yeah, where there are opportunities, we'll certainly make the most of them. Um, whether it's things like tourist infrastructure fund or other opportunities, we'll certainly make the most of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, I I have a couple for you. Um, I might as well go straight to the tracks, which is point 16. Um, you're reporting back to um, community and culture on the strategic plan there. Will you also be reporting that to the transport committee as well, because tracks are part of the regional land transport plan strategies as well? Um, I guess we... Yeah. The, the formal presentation of the council document will be to community and culture, because that's where the delegation yeah. sits but we, that we can make that presentation available to um, wherever. Because I think this, this is one of those things that, sits, that straddles across two areas and, and certainly there's resource in the NZTA spend. If it adds value to the result, yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the playground upgrades and sports and active recreation facility project. I, I, I'm asking, do you have, a, it's been raised with me that we could make playgrounds, we tend to make playgrounds for just 
young children mm -hmm. and we don't make them for teenagers and young adults mm -hmm. and yet other cities have made them and they get an immense amount of use. Mm -hmm. So do you see um, overlap again between those two activities and, and is there any potential maybe that we would be considering in the future playground activities that were catered for an older user? So yes, there's certainly opportunities of overlap of those two projects and when the project meet meeting uh, was held this morning there was that conversation about how we were going to keep that project up to date with playground and tracks and all the other um, related projects how do we make sure that we don't get the siloing in and, and we're talking to each other so it's very much part of our thought process that we do need to do that and then finally question for me it's reserves and beaches bylaw and it's a signage question um, how are we progressing the signage and how long has that been going on for now so um, <laughs> How long has it been going on for? Well, Quite that's kind of, yeah. I know the answer to that question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so we're making good progress, I think. But it, is, it isn't easy, I have to say. Signage, um, as a novice going in, and then getting involved in, in signage issues is quite fascinating given the length and the types, the, the different types and the different organisations that are involved in signage has made it quite challenging. However, uh, what we've been able to do is work very effectively with DOC and other organisations to start to agree some standardisation so that we can declutter some of our spaces and have clearer signage. Um, it's a work in progress, Councillor, that's for sure. Um, but I do think we are making progress um, and we've, uh, we've received some positive feedback. It's, it's nice to know. Um, <laughs> Councillor Elder, you have another question? Uh, just just um, to comment, um, I note that you're working with ORC, DOC and um, ourselves with regard to um, Outram Glen and I was just wondering if you could comment about your um, increased partnership with those um, organisations in achieving outcomes. Yeah, well, I think we've done a lot um, in, in recent times of working very well with particularly DOC. I think um, obviously the DOC parks overlap is significant. Um, and certainly I think we have a really good relationship and um, always opportunities for improvement. But they're very good to work with, I have to say, uh, and helpful. I just want to congratulate you mm. on that. Mm, thanks. There being no more questions, may I have someone move that with the committee notes the Parks and Recreation Activity Report for the period ending 31st of January 2020. Councillor Staines, uh, second. Oh, Councillor Elder, Councillor Hall's been getting a lot of them. Okay, any, do you want to speak to it, Councillor Staines? Anybody wish to speak? Councillor Walker. Yeah, just very briefly, um, th thank you once again, and I certainly don't envy your, um, your signage engagement, rather you than me, Mr West. Um, I just want to say, uh, as was pointed out last week, um, that I think we should all applaud the Parks and Recreation Department's efforts um, around the work it has done over the years related to freedom camping, um, and particularly in terms of addressing and mitigating the issues that were front and centre in the past and now to, to a greater extent are not, so I just want to say well done. Yeah, anybody else wish to speak? Oh, Councillor Elder. I just want to um, congratulate you on that um, partnership with DOC and also um, at updating and, aud and the audit process so that we know where we are at and where we need to go and, uh, and for your vision in that space. So. Thank you for that. I think outdoor recreation and, and sport is a huge part of um, keeping yeah. our people healthy and well, both physically and mentally. And um, I look forward to further the reports coming up. <coughs> I wondered if out, um, for the Outram Glen, if fish and game were, um, um, you know. Councillor, we're, we, question time's over. So you, do you just right. speech time now. Right. That'd be quite good to talk to, maybe. Yes, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Okay, put it those in favour. Those against? Passed.
Now item 8, Waste and Environmental Solutions Activity Report for the two quarters ending December 31st, 2019. Mr Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Do you want to speak to your report or take it as read? Happy to take it as read. Very good. Uh, Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good, good afternoon. The, uh, I can't recall whether you were here or not, uh, but uh, the chair of the um, of the which community? What's it called? Um, Brighton. What day is it today? Which community boards are called? Anyway, one of the community board chairs um, made a comment about reservations in his um, Brighton community about the impending further work on Smooth Hill. Now, we know that thanks to the visionary decisions of our predecessors, we have a designation in place, um, but clearly the um, out of sight, out of mind in every sense uh, would appear to apply to... Uh, the community and these concerns have now been triggered by us talking about doing something about getting that facility consented. Um, so I'm, I'm asking what uh, efforts you are intending to make to inform people about what options there might or might not be and what would appear to be the reality of a development proceeding in that area, given the time frames involved and the pressure that we're under around the imminent closure of um, the existing operation. Uh, okay, see, so I've um, initially when we kicked off the project, I went to both the Saddle Hill Community Board and Mosgill Tyree and explained uh, what we were doing, what we were looking at. Um, I'm visiting them again uh, in the near future to explain where we're up to, uh, including the fact that the the site has already consented. Uh, oh, sorry, not consented. It's designated. Not consented. It's designated uh, as a landfill site, so that that uh, process has already occurred. Um, however, the, cons the cons um, consenting process will be publicly notified, so there will be uh, ability for people to provide feedback, uh, etc., during that process. Okay. Um, the the original process that resulted in the designation of Smooth Hill took at least five years. So many. I would assume that any investigation of any other site, if we were to start again now from scratch, we would anticipate it would take at least five years investigation to come up with a, an alternative site. Um, as you're aware, we do not that, have that time. Thank you. In terms of, I mean, I think it's good to know that you're visiting the community boards. Um, are you um, planning to rely on them to disseminate the sort of content of the, those discussions, or we, are you considering doing that in addition to however they may communicate with their community directly? Uh, I don't, there's no intention to actually, if you're talking about going out to the, into the communities themselves, uh, not until we're actually in the consenting process. Um, there's a fine line between uh, giving the impression that, we're, impression that we're consulting on the site as opposed to actually informing people of the site. So we will be... Um, talking directly with residents, etc., during the consenting process, but not prior to that. Okay, thank you. So, Lord. <laughs> been waving to me. Councillor Gary. <laughs> Just following up on, on that comment you made, I, <clears throat> I had a question uh, around the Saddle Hill community. Um, Will you make it really clear when you go to see the board about how they can make submissions to that consenting process? Because um, certainly the designation was quite a while ago, and certainly before I, I was involved in community board, and I would imagine the current chair long before he was as well. Um, and you've had people arrive in the community since that. And, uh, so, so is that part of your plan, to make sure they understand how to make submissions? Uh, well, yeah, the, the obviously the consenting that consenting process isn't run by DCC as such. There is, well, is some DCC consenting consents required. Yeah. Primarily that process will be via the ORC, yeah, which will course, publicly notify, etc. So I'll, I'll make sure that they understand sure. uh, that process. 
Um, one of the reasons for not talking, because uh, I do understand some of the objections uh, that have been mentioned by the community board, but until we actually have the technical studies complete for the assessment of environmental impacts, we don't actually have all the answers documented for that. So there's uh, not much point talking now when we don't have all the documentation and uh, th that's required. So you'll keep a close communication with the, the board, I'm assuming? Yeah. yeah. Um, my second question was around the sustainable living in the community workshops. Um, I recall some years ago now, a uh, very enlightened DCC ran some wonderful courses, Dr Maureen Howard ran the courses and it was had a behavioural psychology base. Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate, because it's about changing behaviours, that that will be the kind of approach through these courses you're thinking of, workshops you're thinking of running? Uh, yeah, so those courses have continued. Um, there was a, a bit of a break there, but there um, those community based, the, the waste free parenting, sustainable living, uh, love food, hate waste, um, we're making those more readily available and working through community groups as well. So some of the tickets that we give for those are actually given away free via Presbyterian support, those sort of organisations. Um, and yeah, they, they are about behaviour change. Um, and we definitely continue and hoping to roll out uh, more programmes in the future as well. That's good news because they're really good quality. And finally, uh, 30, uh, item 30, which is around the um, curbside waste and recycling collection. Um, can you just remind us uh, of the first available opportunity to implement whatever option council decides to pursue after community engagement? Um, because I think for the community there's a lot of why can't we do it now um, feeling and you've probably felt that considerably. Can you just remind us about the first opportunity to implement anything that's decided uh, upon? Well, just, uh, yeah, the, um, the reason we can't do it now is because it's not budgeted. Um, the engagement on the potential ideas of what, what of the changes will occur alongside the um, uh, around the same time frame as the annual plan. Um, that's hopefully we will get a clear idea from the public of what they want to see, which we will then complete a business complete the business case with detailed costings, etc., and take that into the ten year plan. Uh, and there'd be. Once it's um, council has approved that, or, um, there would be then the procurement phase. So it'd probably be another at least 12 months after approval before we could actually uh, inst instigate a new service. So that would be when, uh, just to be clear. So basically, it'd be um, the middle of 2022 at the earliest. So we've got black plastic bags until then. Yes. Councillor Vandervis. On page 41, paragraph 2, we've got uh, highlighted successful increased diversion of material. Um, but if you look at the graph on page 43, it shows that, in fact, pretty much the identical amount has been diverted. Uh, and that's on 10. And above it on 9, it says that we're trying to aim for an increase of 2% annual growth in diverted material sold. So there are three different references to diverted material here, none of which line up. Uh, so the first bullet point you're talking about? Uh, under the under, highlights? Under two, highlight. Yeah, so that's... Uh, increased diversion. Yeah, so that's the talking about waste management, so that's not curbside, that is just at the Green Island landfill with putting in additional opportunities for people to divert when they actually go to the transfer station. Oh, this is basically bits of furniture that need to be reused or something. Yeah, but steel, furniture, glass, okay. that kind of stuff, um, giving them an opportunity to actually divert that even up to just before they put it in the pit at the transfer station. Okay, um, but that doesn't show on the recycling diversion no, graph in 10. So that graph there is about the, the sold material um, going through OJ, through the collect, material collected by EnviroWaste and um, processed by OJI Fibre Solutions. So we're not actually diverting any more of the sold material? Uh, that's, though that, that graph just re relates to the curbside. What does number nine above that uh, saying that we should be... Uh, having more than a 2% annual growth in diverted materials sold. 
Yeah, so that's a, an old measure that's been in place for quite some time, unfortunately, uh, which will hopefully be changing in this 10-year plan. But that measure is simply saying that every year we sell an extra 2% on what we did the year before of recycled material. But that's not been something that we can do? No, that is, it, well, originally um, that was occurring, but it's remained steady for quite some time now. So that 2% that target has not been achieved. Uh, so last, it was achieved the year, sorry, i tell a lie. It, was achieved, it wasn't achieved last financial year, but it was achieved the financial year before that. So is the intention then to change the target, or, or as you suggested just now, or because it's an old target, or to do something different regarding the diversion? Uh, so in, we're actually we're on to current, current matters at the moment. The um, goals of the proposed WMMP uh, that uh, is coming to, um, forget the name of the committee tomorrow, uh, we're proposing three definitive targets in there. Um, that one there is basically just around material sold. It doesn't actually talk about uh, increased diversion or reduced carbon impact or anything else like that. So that is quite outdated now. So we're proposing new measures. Yeah. So you're saying you don't anticipate there'll be an increase in sold material in the, in the foreseeable future? Uh, not without a change to our curbside collection program and, uh, and the facilities we provide. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Um, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for um, what was a really, really robust and interesting report, actually. And little did I know when I ran for council that I'd be so inspired by a report on waste. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, because I may have passed it by, but in this fantastic report, I didn't uh, see any mention of cigarette butts. And as you probably are aware, in all... Um, in all waste audits, I think cigarette butts come out number one as the most found item, and of course they have um, extremely detrimental effects on our wildlife and the wider environment. Um, are you aware uh, if, if Council has any initiatives moving forward to address the question of cigarette butts? Yep, thank you. Just so you know, um, uh, Mr Pickford's working and he heads some Pickford, the regulatory area, and there's some work going on with the Smoke Free Group, Public Health South, about what we might do uh, in various parts of the city around being smoke free. So that work's underway. They wrote to us recently and Simon came back and said, yep, we're, we're exploring our options here. It's something that we'd like to, to look at as well. So smoke free then by definition means you also deal with the butts issue. Um, I guess one of the I've asked this question primarily because in Port Chalmers we have a significant issue with cigarette butts and of course related to people coming from other from other countries so I don't see how the smoke free would address that issue so I was wondering if there's anything be above and beyond that that may be in the wind are you actually talking about a litter issue in the in the streets from the cigarette butts or yeah um, it's sort of a a nasty crossover because we do uh, most of the rubbish bins, not all by a long stretch in the main nation, but a large number of rubbish bins do have uh, the facility for putting out your butt and sticking them in a. Um, but apart from actually having some resources to uh, monitor, the problem actually then it tends to become transport problems because it becomes a street cleaning problem as opposed to a. Uh, a litter problem. So if you know, people do not use the facilities provided without monitoring and enforcement, there's not a lot we can do about it. So it's often this situation where something moves from one department to another depending on where it landed. Councillor <laughs> 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 Elder. I suppose lots of departments would like then for things to be thrown in the gutter and become someone else's problem. <laughs> um, just um, talking about budgets and the, the imminency of um, needing to um, get Smooth Hill up and running, um, is there enough in the budget for the work to be scoped and the staffing to actually activate that? in a timely manner? Uh, or so do we need more resources? I know there, there has been sufficient operational budget allocated to for the um, 
to support the consenting process, yes. Um, so that, and, and the design, preliminary design work, everything else that has been, um, operational budget has been allocated to that and it's sufficient at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Houlihan. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify, what is product stewardship? On uh, page 44. So is that relating to the ones that were released by... Oh, okay, sorry, yes. Um, so product stewardship is basically a scheme where you make the producer responsible for cleaning it up afterwards. Uh -huh. um, so going back to the good old days where you had... Um, glass container deposit, so you took your Coke bottle back to the dairy and got eight cents back or whatever it was. Right. Um, that is basically a, the product stewardship. So it's, some people call it product stewardship or it's called an extended container deposit scheme, various names, mm. but it's basically about an additional cost when you buy a material that is then used to fund a collection and recycling of that material. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. Around the latches on recycle bins, which I think is a great idea, by the way, if you live in an area that's a bit windy, can you ring up and say, hey, could you use me for the trial as well, or not really? Uh, well, we've got 850 properties identified, which yeah. was identified in the areas that uh, Enviro West told us they have the biggest problem. Um, at the moment, we're trying to there's three different strengths of latches, and the ones we're using at the moment, uh, we're getting reported, we've only have a 50% success rate. Oh, Apparently, right. some trucks are struggling to get the bin open, and other trucks are obviously a bit more vicious, and they're not having any problem with it whatsoever. <laughs> um, so we're looking like we need to go back and uh, try and a different it. strength right. of latch, but the idea would be that yeah, um, that would become standard fitment. Once we get once we get ones that work well, right? Yeah. Yes, great idea. Um, page forty-five, number twenty-seven, um, where it talks about um, the waste futures. Uh, that some of the, all the updates were done prior to the new council coming in. So the four of us new councillors, I don't believe, have had an update on that. Would it be possible to get an update on that? Or maybe we have, but I just read those dates, and they were prior to us um, coming in. Uh, yeah, I mean, either I can get provided or actually the GSOs as well can actually pull all those reports um, and give them to you as well. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Councillor Walker. Uh, so, sorry, I had another question. I just got slightly um, thrown off course by the rather gloomy response to my butt question. Okay. <laughs> um, it, was quest, uh, it was item four. Uh, the second bullet point just at the end where, and I think we've alluded to this in some of the workshops, um, uh, where we talk about material recovery centre for sorting and transportation to recycling markets. Um, what are those markets and are they sustainable moving forward in the context of the fact that so many other parts of the world now quite rightly are not prepared to take a crap? Uh, well, the markets are sustainable if you can meet the contamination targets. Um, so obviously China has brought in quite strict standards, Malaysia is following suit, India is following suit. Um, so yes, you can continue to sell material overseas if you can meet the, um, the contamination criteria, which in a lot of cases now is less than 1%. Um, that's not easy and we're struggling, uh, but with sufficient um, investment in improved recovery facilities, you would be able to meet those targets without, uh, you know, regularly. Yeah. So you say the requirement is one percent contamination. What do you know? What we're at? Uh, well, that's that's after sorting. So, unfortunately, what is happening is more of more recycling is actually ending up in landfill because of those contamination requirements. Um, so the sorting facility has been a lot stricter on what they will accept and what they will not. Um, so. Yeah, our contamination contamination rate at curbside sometimes varies between eight to eleven percent, uh, depending on the month. So, quite a bit of that contaminated material is then uh, rejected by the sorting facility to get it down to the one percent. Councillor Barker. 
I have um, three questions. First of all, uh, just about public awareness of where people can get things recycled, etc. What happens to polystyrene? Is there an opportunity to get rid of that? Not in Dunedin at the moment. We we don't have a facility down here. That's something I'm um, talking to a waste manager about trying to introduce. Uh, it is available further north, Omaru, uh, sorry, not Omaru, Tumaru and, and uh, Christchurch have that ability, but we don't down here at this point now. Um, my second question, I, number um, 24, was about battery recycling. I wasn't aware, maybe I'm ignorant, about that you could take your batteries out to the um, Green Island rummage store. Is that correct? How does that work? People just take their batteries out there? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've used um, some of the waste levy funding that we receive from central government, obviously, which was paid at the landfill gate fees. Mm -hmm. Uh, we subsidise quite a bit of e-waste, e-electronic recycling. Um, things like batteries, you know, you've got a double A battery or a triple A battery and no one sees why they should have to pay mm -hmm. uh, to recycle that. Um, and also we found that the price point of $40 for a TV uh, for recycling was far too high. So when we reduced those rates by subsidising them, because uh, all our electronic waste goes to cargo enterprises, when we started subsidising, our rates for recovery of that stuff has increased dramatically. Um, with the batteries, it's hard to have the collection points. With um, talking to uh, supermarkets, etc., about having collection points, but there is a, a fire danger, especially with lithium batteries. So yeah. it does become problematic. Um, it's just about public awareness. You have the, that, those wonderful things about what you should put in your, in your um, recycling bin, etc. But just batteries is always. I've got to always stockpile at home. That's why I ask. And my other question was around number twenty-five, which is the bike refurbishment program, which I think is amazing. Uh, what's the limitation on the amount of um, bikes able to be refurbished? Uh, just as the number of bikes dropped off to rummage still exceeds the amount able to be refurbished, and I wonder what was the... Um Basically, it's the, um, it's the resources available to the trust. Um, they have to have someone who's actually um, certified as able to sign off the bike has been safe, etc. Um, a, lot, a lot of volunteer work, so they just have a capability issue trying to um, dismantle or fix uh, a, the large number of bikes we get out of the landfill. We normally have about 300 piled up uh, at any one point in time. Is there any way we can facilitate that moving ahead? Uh, well, uh, yes. Um, we're working on what we can try and do, what, what other groups we can try and get involved to give the Malcolm Trust a helping hand with that. Um, yeah, uh, nothing has come up so far, but we're still working on it. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Hulan. Um, are you able to say what percentage of the um, recycling that you can't get rid of is newspapers? Uh, oh, sorry. The new the the recycling that we ended up with is sitting out at Greenock. Yes. Uh, um, so it's all fine, but I can't actually give you exact quantity for how much. But of it's it is. quite a bit of it. You were saying, I think the other day, is a reasonable amount of it newspaper. Yeah, it's, it's all fibre. So it is all, there's no plastic. It's all either cardboard or fibre or magazines right. or newspapers, etc. Yeah. I'm just wondering, just a, we might already do this, I don't know, but is there any way that, say, for example, a newspaper could, say, if it went, put more things into digital or something, so therefore cut down the um, print that they're creating, um, can they get some funding from, you know, how we said we get a fund from for helping decrease waste, you know, is that something that could be used for? Uh, well, we have the commercial fund that they were, um, talked about back on uh, item 12 in the report is on the waste minimisation grant. So we do have um, one funding round a year with $70,000 available for commercial. Um, and then we have a community group and a small grants funding as well. Um, so that, that's that's the money that we have available for those kind of initiatives. But we also get um, funding um, for the amount of rubbish that we get, you know, sent to the tip, don't we, that, yeah. to the landfill, that we then get back to use for waste minimisation yep. um, opportunities or, or projects. Is that correct? Yep, and so that money is all allocated for the education programs that we were talking about before, the education programs subsidising e-waste, uh, these grants, and uh, it also actually pays the salary for two of my staff 
um, okay. for waste minimisation officer and the education promotions officer. Right, so we haven't got money that we could pay to businesses to give them an incentive to decrease their, their waste apart for the 70,000. Not sufficient funding to make a big no. difference. No. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I have a few. Um, the 506 tonnes of contamination against 3,799 tonnes looks to be about 13% is rejected with contam contamination. Does that all go to landfill? If it's if it's contaminated, is that, re is that where it goes? Rejected recycling, you tend to landfill. Okay, yeah. cool. And of the stuff that we do recycle, are we still selling all of it or are we starting to have trouble finding the markets now? Uh, it's always a str well, ever since China sort of came in, it is a struggle trying to find markets. Um, we have had, we haven't had any significant issues so far. We are still managing to find markets, but okay. it is getting harder every day. Cool. And then um, point twelve, the waste minimisation grants. Um, now that I can understand why they are at community and culture, because most of our grants are, are gone through there. Um, but how are these grants assessed against the waste futures and is the grants committee given guidance when they're selecting these grants on our waste futures um, aspirations at the same time? Uh, the, obviously the waste, um, those, the, new, the new updated targets haven't been adopted yet. Um, so at the moment the selection criteria is based on the existing WMP which dates from 2013. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, those, uh, those targets aren't actually used for assessment. However, the objectives of the WMMP are used as part of the assessment criteria. Okay, and then of the grants that we have handed out, um, how do we assess that they have in fact been used for the purposes that we've given them money for and have achieved the objectives that were in the grant? Yeah, we can't, um, it's hard to guarantee, but we do actually follow up. Um, you know, the money has to be used within 12 months, and we actually uh, request follow up reports from them, which are actually giving us the data about uh, the, the project, the, um, the success of the project, and what was achieved with that money. Okay, so will we, will we get that back at some point in a report on the effectiveness of these grants and how they are achieving? Uh, it will go back to the um, community and culture. Yeah. Back, back to community and culture. Yeah. And I've just got a quick e-waste question. Are our e-waste the same across the city, or um, and where are the other e-waste sites other than Green Island? Uh, so at the moment, though, there aren't any. Um, I think computer peripherals, um, office, uh, is it the office depot or warehouse stationery? One or the other, they will actually take uh, computer peripherals, computer equipment for free. Uh, that's a nationwide scheme. Apart from that, there is pretty much only Cargill's Enterprises which is full price for items you want to drop off. Um, the only subsidised area for drop off is Green Island Rummage Store. And what's the rationale that we subsidise it there and then don't subsidise it at the other sites? Uh, well, I mean, obviously Cargill Enterprises isn't um, anything to do with council as such. We use them as our, as our processing for our electrical waste. But um, that would basically be, if we were to subsidise, that would probably be falling into the realm of a grant or some form of assistance there um, and also that would be all other materials dropped off basically it's a case of the material from the rummage store is what we control so we subsidize that we couldn't establish so so you don't think we could establish a contractor relationship with other receivers such as cargo enterprises that in such a way that they could do the inventory in the same way it's done at green island uh, potentially, I think there's a, quite a few fish hooks in there, but it, potentially it could be done with uh, if funding was made available from somewhere. Okay, thanks. That's it for me. Any more questions? A mover that we accept the report. Councillor Walker, seconder. Councillor Hall. Anybody wish to speak? Councillor Gary. Yes, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr Henderson and the team around um, the work done, which also ties in with. Uh, the work done by the grant subcommittee so we support the Malcolm Trust uh, and we're certainly aware of the bike scheme. Um, the grant subcommittee has been involved in uh, robustly looking at uh, the various criteria for granting the uh, various grants. In fact just um, two days ago I signed off one of the small grants which goes towards waste minimisation. <clears throat> I'm particularly delighted to see the work that the team has been doing in the, pre the tertiary precinct. I think that's um, particularly worthwhile and will speak to 
uh, the student's desire to be good citizens, um, which I think is the majority of students, in fact. Um, and also good to hear about your work with the Saddle Hill Community Board around the Smooth Hill project. I think for many people, they kind of missed the designation process because they weren't kind of involved or aware of the process. Uh, and so uh, perhaps it's been a bit of a surprise for some in the community. Uh, and so your, your work with the Community Board is really important. So thank you. Anybody else wants to speak? I'll put it. Those in favour? No. Against? Past. Thank you. Um, item number nine, property services activity report for the two quarters ending on 31st December 2019. Mr. Bainbridge Zafar has got married and changed his name. Welcome. <laughs> Do you wish to speak to the report at all or just ask, take it as read? Any questions? Councillor Van der Vis. In the executive summary part 2B, you talk about Wall Street management now being outsourced to Colliers International. Um, has there been a consequent reduction in property services staff numbers, given that this used to take a lot of staff uh, members' time? No, but it's allowed us to realign the staff's priorities to other properties. So the full-time work that was required for this particular um, job, uh, plus some other work, is just been realigned? The full-time role that was uh, that did exist in property services structure was disestablished a number of years ago. Since then, Wall Street Mall has been lumped in with all of our other commercial investment properties and managed by a single person. Okay. Um, community housing, Palmyra, there was an issue a year or so ago with some of the units not meeting the new government standards for insulation. Have they now all been caught up on and are they all tenanted? So Palmyra was fully tenanted until we've cleared one block to do the redevelopment work and we'll be doing redevelopment works on each of the four blocks over the next four years. They currently comply with legislation, however, to meet new legislation that comes into effect from 1 July 2024, this work needs to, needs to happen. So you're going to be down a block every year for the next four years in Palmyra and just to do that yeah. compliance work? Yep. Okay, thank you. I just have one question. Could you just give us a quick update on the South Northern Library and Community Complex work, how that's going? Uh, yeah, the co-design process has, has got underway. Um, there is, uh, or there was a million dollars uh, in this year's budgets to, to start doing that design process. That process will lead to a design and an associated budget that will uh, be presented as part of the annual plan for next year and then into the long-term plan thereafter. And Mr Pickford can speak to that at Community and Culture tomorrow um, in probably more detail. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, can I have a mover that we accept the report? Councillor Staines seconded. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Councillor Barker. I just have a question, obviously as a new councillor, Ree, the railway station just says first stage design completed. Exterior repair work, I was unaware of what needed to be done there. Just curious. Oh, sorry, page um, 60 something F. Yeah. Next steps, F. Um, yeah, the railway station, similar to this building that we're in, um, is a very old building, um, so it's just coming up with a maintenance plan for the next 10 years, making sure well, the old... falling off or anything. Making sure bits don't fall off. Thank you. OK. Now any more, any more questions? Councillor Van Vis. There was a suggestion uh, last year, I think, that the waiting list had got so long for council flats that you'd actually closed it. I see that you've got a number of, I think it was 40-odd uh, applicants, and you're able to accommodate 10 of them. Does this mean that your waiting list is basically open again? 
I'm not aware of the waiting list ever being closed. Okay. So it's still open. I, I'm not aware of it ever being closed. Right. Um, that may have been a reference to people that don't qualify for what we class as priority one, so people who are over the age of 55 on low income. We haven't housed anyone who doesn't fall into that category for a long time. Ah, so, so it's staff, that category that's closed rather than... It's still open, but our staff will explain to those applicants that they are highly unlikely to be housed any time in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? <coughs> okay, can I have a, can I have a move to Councillor Staines, um, seconder? Councillor Benson-Pope, you wish to speak? Anybody wish to speak to the motion? Um, did I put it? Those in favour? Those against? Passed. To the end of those reports and just item 10, um, items for consideration by the Chair and I just would recall um, Councillor Benson Pope. Uh, just a request Mr Chairman for as part of our regular non-financial reporting as appropriate to have some information about uh, the vehicle speed data that uh, staff collect but haven't up until now reported to us. Very good, I think we can capture that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elder. Um, I was just um, thinking about the National Transport Plan and the Regional tr Transport Plan and in, in, in particular um, for the mode shift and for linkages between communities and a number of communities desire for, um, <coughs> for cycle trails and walking trails between their communities, for example, Waihola to Mosgill. Um, and was wondering what the process is for those communities if they want to put those towards a regional transport plan and a national transport plan. Were some of those communities willing to fundraise for those? Um, well, transport team's not here right now, but so I guess Mr Drew might be the nearest to answer. That, that also relates to the extension of um, the Portobello as well. So is the question about how does the community get involved or how, how does transport... Uh, yeah, because I mean, that's being new to council is some of the process bits that I don't get. Um, but ones that I do know are the annual plan and long-term plan setting process. So this is something different. Just I think we'll, we go away and we'll, we'll find out from staff what the mechanism would be for um, those communities to feed through into that um, process and flick a note round to councillors. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Um, yes, Mr Chair, uh, I'd like to seek an update from the, I guess it's the Met Service, I'm not certain, um, but that we seek an update from whichever organisation it is around the progress towards the installation of a rain radar. Very good. Can I leave that with you, Ms Graham? To I understand the Chief Executive is um, doing that as we speak. Very good. Well, if that's the end of these items of consideration, then I call this meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you.